the most sophisticated jumbo jet on the planet. A helicopter hardened against electromagnetic pulses. Armor-plated limousines. These aren't your ordinary planes, trains, and automobiles. These are top secret. And there are only two ways to find out what they're really like inside. Get elected or stay tuned. On September 11th, 2001, during the chaos of the terrorist attacks, President George W. Bush boarded a special four-engine turbofan Boeing 747 jumbo jet. Tail number, 28000. Like any Air Force vehicle carrying the president, this craft was designated Air Force One. With the president a potential target, the jet took off at an angle steeper than this more typical takeoff to avoid a possible surface-to-air missile assault. The passengers on board thought it was near vertical ascent out full throttle, you know, in a national emergency. And of course, as that fateful day unfolded, Air Force One was the extension of the White House, a refuge, a means of travel, a symbol of the American presidency. This plane, one of two nearly identical jumbo jets designed for presidential use, was deployed in a deception maneuver as Bush was taken from Florida on a circuitous route back to Washington. Air Force One is not a stealth aircraft. Still, had it come under attack, the pilots would have had at their disposal certain defensive measures. There is a passive anti-missile defense system in the tail of the aircraft that is designed to defeat infrared missiles by emitting a heat source that produces more heat than the exhaust of the aircraft engines. A decoy system can fool the missile and uh, draw the missile away from the aircraft. Civilian analysts also speculate that Air Force One is insulated against microchip damaging EMPs or electromagnetic pulses like those produced by a nuclear blast. The purpose of course is for Air Force One to be able to fly in wartime including nuclear wartime and to be able to carry the president. Much of this is shrouded in secrecy, uh, but we know that such systems exist and they would represent the very state of art when it comes to providing defensive capabilities for an airplane. Lay experts strongly believe that Air Force One does not have offensive weapons. After all, it is in the end a transport airplane and it is not a weapon of war, although it, it can be a wartime uh, command post. Air Force One can fly at speeds approaching 630 miles an hour, as high as 45,000 feet above the Earth. This 800,000 pound, 231 foot long jet contains some of the most advanced communications equipment in the world, including encryption and scrambling devices for secure links to the ground. There are also 85 phones, including secure lines and two-way radios, plus fax machines, 19 televisions, and computer ports. A conference room and private presidential suite, plus a galley capable of preparing 2,000 meals, keep the president a functioning chief executive, miles above the Earth's surface. An operating room next to an emergency room can handle medical crises. The plane has become uh, an extension of the White House. It's a flying Oval Office. Without Air Force One, getting the president back to the Capitol quickly and safely on September 11th would have been far more difficult. All presidential movers are designed to keep the president safe, and by extension, our government working. For more than 150 years, trains, autos, airplanes, and helicopters have been transformed into high-tech cocoons. We need to safely transport the most powerful person in the world, but these vehicles have become potent symbols themselves of the office they serve. Nixon landing in China, opening up China. What, what greater image do we have of that, of an American plane, you know? Uh, here, here's America, guys, you know, and Reagan leaving the negotiating table, calling Gorbachev's bluff in Iceland and getting in his plane and flying back. We have the world defined by president who can get on a plane, fly across half the world, stand before a wall built by a dictatorial regime and defy that regime. And therefore, as a free man, 
I take pride in the word, Ich bin ein Violiner. And they often play their part in our most profound national dramas. Kennedy's assassination in 1963, Roosevelt's death in 1945, Nixon's resignation in 1974. Perhaps the most technologically impressive of all the presidential movers are the airplanes. The current 747s are the latest in an evolution that began with the first airplane to ever take a president aloft in St. Louis, Missouri, back in 1910. The first president to fly was Theodore Roosevelt. However, he was not the president of the United States at the time. He had left office, but he actually got into a Wright Brothers aircraft and went around. This historic and dangerous trip, captured by another fledgling technology, motion pictures, was the first of a series of presidential milestones to take place in the air. Another Roosevelt was the first presidential candidate to fly during a run for office. Well, in 1932, Franklin Delano Roosevelt flew on a Ford trimotor from Albany, New York, to Chicago to accept the nomination of the Democratic Party. And this was really an extraordinary event. We have a perfect day for this trip, and I'm very happy to be going out to Chicago. And everybody knows the reason why I'm so happy. Breaking precedent. Roosevelt became the first candidate to accept his party's nomination in person. Flying to the convention was as much a political as a practical consideration. Maybe he also saw uh, the sense of modernity with flight, you know, descending in Chicago as this uh, uh, redemptive figure who's going to lead the United States out of the dark days of the Great Depression. Necessity rather than symbolism forced Roosevelt back on board during the Second World War. In January of 1943, a full 11 years after his trip to Chicago, he became the first sitting president to fly, traveling to a conference in Casablanca in a Boeing 314 Clipper seaplane. The journey took 90 hours in flying time round trip and covered over 17,000 miles. The secrecy was such that the crew uh, of the Dixie Clipper uh, only knew that a Mr. Jones, and, and, uh, who was passenger number one, was going to board the, the Dixie Clipper for the flight. But they were escorted by fighters, and they made this arduous uh, uh, trip down to Brazil. And then they crossed uh, the South Atlantic to British Gambia. And then he uh, was transferred to a, a C-54 four-engine transport that flew into Casablanca. Roosevelt's appearance in Casablanca allowed him to engage in personal diplomacy with his allied counterparts at a crucial stage in the war. In December of that same year, he flew to Tehran on a C-54 Skymaster. Clearly, the president needed a plane at his disposal, and a Skymaster was soon converted for his use. Now, this aircraft had special features. It has an armor-proof window so the president wants to look out the window he certainly can it also has accommodations to carry a large number of people they have extra gas tanks built into the aircraft to extend the range of the aircraft the most significant modification to the plane acknowledged another less publicized presidential mover roosevelt's wheelchair they build an elevator into the back of the airplane this way president roosevelt's wheelchair can be rolled onto the elevator he can be raised into the aircraft Roosevelt used his C-54, unofficially nicknamed the Sacred Cow, only once in February of 1945, traveling to an Allied conference at Yalta on the Black Sea. Harry S. Truman inherited the plane two months later, upon Roosevelt's death. He flew to Potsdam, Germany, for the last of the wartime conferences in July of 1945. And uh, Truman routinely conducted business on board the presidential aircraft. He signed the National Security Act of 1947, which created the Defense Department, the Air Force, and the CIA, among many other things. And it was an example of conduct of presidential business while flying. Aviation technology had advanced rapidly by the time Truman was signing laws in midair, and the sacred cow had been replaced by a new DC-6 with a pressurized cabin. 
This is an important uh, step up in technology because this airplane was larger, had greater range, and uh, really represented a new level of flying comfort for the president. And the livery of this plane, the Independence, was uh, unique. It has the stylized look of an eagle. You know, the, the cockpit nose looks like the beak of the eagle and the feathers going down the fuselage and so forth. Had a real exotic look to it. Maybe a little too exotic. Early color photos of the livery or external appearance of the plane reveal a yellow paint scheme that was soon changed. President Truman's aircraft, the Independence, had in the nose a weather radar designed to help it navigate and paint can and does interfere with radar and it is very possible that the color of the nose of Truman's airplane was changed so that the weather radar on the plane would work better. The independents flew Truman to Wake Island in October of 1950 to confront General Douglas MacArthur who refused to follow administration policy in Korea. This presidential journey began one of the greatest crises of Truman's presidency, which culminated in his firing MacArthur. Upon his election in 1952, Dwight Eisenhower became the first president who knew how to fly a plane. The Air Force kept ahead of the technology curve by transforming a new Lockheed 749 Constellation into the official presidential plane. Upgraded in 1954 to a Super Constellation, these planes were the first presidential aircraft with a private presidential suite and a conference table. The Columbine 3, which is the one that's on display at the United States Air Force Museum, this aircraft had the latest in technology available for the President of the United States. He could make a telephone call from the airplane and be connected to someone on the ground. Plus, he had a teletype machine. Despite the improved technology on board Columbine 3, the piston-driven constellations were far behind the new jet-powered aircraft that were overtaking the commercial airline industry in the mid-1950s. The office of the President of the United States needed the biggest, fastest, most advanced plane available. In 1959, President Eisenhower would become a presidential traveler on the first in a line of presidential jets. Today's Air Force One jumbo jets are the latest in a series of jet-powered aircraft that began in the late 1950s. The switch from piston-driven aircraft was a product of technology and Cold War one-upmanship. Premier Khrushchev had a jet. Therefore, the State Department convinced the President of the United States and Congress that the President of the United States needed to move up to jet aircraft. The aircraft was a Boeing 707. Uh, known to the military as a C-137A. It was not built and earmarked specifically for presidential travel, but Eisenhower flew on this aircraft. Tail number SAM for Special Air Mission 709 was the first plane designated with a radio call sign Air Force One. Initially, an airplane was named based upon the mission number the airplane was flying so the number would change periodically unfortunately one day president eisenhower was using a number very similar to one being used by an eastern airlines aircraft and there was some confusion as to which aircraft the president of the united states was on to make certain that never happened again the air force adopted a code word a secret code word air force one the name carried over even to the smaller air force planes the president occasionally used but the secret got out, and the term Air Force One caught on. So did 707s. Everybody recognized this aircraft as leading all others in advancement aviation. This was the aircraft. A new 707, tail number SAM-26000, joined a new president, who recognized that the orange Air Force security paint job had to go. The Kennedys, with their uh, interest in style and, and their flair for that, uh, enlisted Raymond Lowe. He was an industrial designer, a very famous one, to see if he could come up with a new livery, a new paint scheme. The light blue, silver, and white livery proudly displaying United States of America with the American flag on the tail and the presidential seal on the door was iconic. 
I think it's a paint scheme that just really fits the airplane. Uh, I personally think it fit the 707 to a T. The new Air Force One had style and substance over the Eisenhower era Columbine 3, which Kennedy still had access to. The difference between these two aircraft is like night and day. The 707 is much faster, going along at about 550 miles an hour as opposed to 300 miles an hour. It is truly transcontinental. The aircraft cannot be refueled in flight, but it carries enough fuel that it can get across the Atlantic and well into any place it needs to go. Sam 2 6000 had the most up-to-date electronics and communication systems available. It also flew higher and more smoothly than previous planes. Kennedy's original presidential suite gave the chief executive some privacy, with a bedroom in addition to plush, comfortable chairs. In 1963, the plane entered the record books. President Kennedy wasn't on board, but a U.S. delegation flew to Moscow in 1963, and they broke 30 world records, including the fastest time from the United States to the Soviet Union. In June of that year, Kennedy took Sam 2 6000 for his dramatic visit to Berlin. But the jet made a more memorable impression in Dallas on November 22nd. And it will be only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the trademark. Something has happened in the motorcade route. Stand by, please. Members of the crew listened in shock as news of the president's assassination was broadcast. It had been announced that the, uh, they thought that the president was, was not going to make it. And uh, it was, which was unbelievable. Within hours, Air Force One was transformed into a beer to carry the president's body back to Washington, D.C. It just hit me that uh, you, we cannot, you know, put the president's body in the cargo compartment. And then I made the suggestion that, uh, says, well, we got to put the casket in the cabin. And there was some discussion and a little disagreement. It won't fit. It won't go, the casket won't go. And I said, yes, it will. After the casket was placed inside the plane, Lyndon Johnson insisted he be sworn in before the plane took off, with Mrs. Kennedy by his side. And that's one of the most uh, searing and memorable photographs in American history of Jacqueline Kennedy standing there with that blood splattered uh, outfit on. So there's Air Force One, and it's at the epicenter uh, of the American experience at that point. As president, Johnson altered Sam 2 6000 to fit his style, removing partitions to better see what was going on from his suite at the rear of the plane. Johnson also used the plane as leverage, offering an exclusive ride as a political plum. Twice he visited troops in Vietnam. When Richard Nixon took office in 1969, Sam 2 6000 was being renovated. They literally stripped the airplane on the inside from the very nose to the very tail of the aircraft. They took out everything, put new wiring, new electronics, and by doing that, it made it a true working White House. A new Boeing 707, Sam 2 7000, joined the fleet in 1972. And together, the planes helped Nixon conduct foreign policy in Russia and China. But in 1974, Nixon resigned the presidency amidst the Watergate scandal. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. He left Washington for the last time as president on August 9th, traveling back home to California. The pilot took note of the fact that Gerald Ford would be sworn in as president around noon, and the plane was over Kansas City uh, traffic control at that very moment and the pilot called down and the designator ceased to be Air Force One and became Sam 26,000. President Nixon then became Citizen Nixon. My instructions were that at noon when everything was too past and they were going to have a martini together. They did have a martini at, at, uh, at the passing of the guard, so to speak. The symbolic power of Air Force One backfired for President Ford when a stumble down the steps in front of the plane with Mrs. Ford became an emblematic image of his presidency. One of the stewards would, would try to 
hold the umbrella for her and, and another steward for, for the president. But President Ford uh, refused that day. He said, I'll take the umbrella. And he slipped a little bit, thought I'd lost my job. Got a few phone calls that evening. Both Presidents Carter and Reagan used Air Force One as a diplomatic tool and to symbolize the strength and power of the presidency. Most memorably during Reagan's visit to Berlin in 1987, an echo of Kennedy's trip 25 years earlier. Sam 27,000 took uh, Ronald Reagan to Berlin too to make another epic speech. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. And that's another way of looking at Air Force One. It's kind of an arrow going through the sky, taking presidents to, to very pivotal meetings. By the end of Reagan's term, Air Force One needed an upgrade, and he signed the order for the current 747s. Good heavens. Oops, I'm sorry. Roomy Santa. Santa. I just want to peek. Yeah. Isn't this beautiful? See the hot tub? <laughs> Delivered after the Reagan term, they have served Presidents Bush Sr., Clinton, and George W. Bush. It seems like we've reached technologically kind of a plateau. The current 747s represent in terms of speed and, and accommodations and technical uh, sophistication, everything you would need. More than any of the other vehicles that transport the President of the United States, Air Force One has become an extension of the president's power and influence. You've got this beacon of freedom landing on foreign soil, taking one of the most powerful men in the world to their particular country. So I think the symbolism is hugely important. When that airplane pulls up to the spot for arrival and the, the door comes open and the president comes out, I think that really symbolizes the strength of our country. Obviously, we have many symbols of strength in the country, but I don't think any show more strength than, than Air Force One. Long before Air Force One was sending presidents all over the world in the comfort of a flying office, chief executives got by with less efficient modes of transportation. For the first presidents, the horse and carriage represented the pinnacle of speed and comfort. The revolution in transportation over the last century has allowed the president a variety of options. Planes, trains, and automobiles that simply didn't exist in 1789. For George Washington, transportation wasn't all that different from that of the Roman emperors, and it invariably involved horses. He went up and journeyed through uh, New England with Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and, and he did this in his diaries. He talks about how he was there not not for his own personal benefit or enjoyment. He just wanted the country to share the experience of him as president. Most early presidents, however, kept near the capital. James Monroe was an exception. In 1817 and 1819, he made two arduous carriage journeys through the north and south to inspect defenses. Monroe paid for both trips because there was no official budget for such excursions. In Boston, it's reported that 40,000 people traveled into the city just to get a peek at their president. When Lincoln, a promoter of railroads, took office in 1861, rails were tying the continent together. He used it to his benefit. He used it to get up to Gettysburg, for example, wrote a little speech on the way there. For Lincoln, there's a lot of safety concerns. Very famously, he snuck into Washington as president-elect because it was perceived there was a plot in Baltimore to assassinate him. In 1864, Congress ordered a special rail car to safely transport Lincoln during the Civil War, the first vehicle built for a president and paid for by the government. It's a magnificent car, and he doesn't get to ride in it until he's shot and he's dead and can no longer enjoy it. But that car made them one of the most famous train journeys of a president ever, slowly with the bell chiming and constantly all the way back to Springfield, Illinois, carrying Lincoln's body and the country mourning alongside the road. Rutherford B. Hayes achieved an important presidential milestone in 1880 during one of his many travels. They called him Rutherford the Rover, and one of his achievements was that he took a train and uh, went to the West Coast. And that act is incredibly symbolic. Now the president has gone to the people in Oregon and California. He's, not only can they go to him, but now he has gone to them. After Hayes, 
luxury loaners from railroad magnates whisked presidents across America. Not until World War II did Congress agree to pay for a specially reinforced custom Pullman rail car for the president's safety. They put in three inch thick glass. They also added five eighths inch armor plating to the car and all the areas where the president would normally be. They also added two escape hatches to the car. One is in the roof of the lounge and the other is in the uh, outer wall of the bathroom. Named Ferdinand Magellan, the 84 foot long, 145 ton car had telephones in every room, an observation lounge, dining room, and four bedrooms. President Franklin Roosevelt had a special narrow wheelchair designed for use within its hallways. After FDR's death, the car was used in the funeral train that brought his body back to Washington, echoing Lincoln's journey 80 years earlier. Mrs. Roosevelt sat in the Magellan while Roosevelt's body was carried in another car. President Truman, uh, who succeeded President Roosevelt, did use the car, again, quite extensively, especially in the uh, election campaign, where he did over 300 speeches from the rear of the Magellan. Truman's whistle-stop campaign from the Magellan was one factor in his upset win against Dewey in 1948. It was also the setting for a famous photograph of a presidential mover and a journalistic blunder. That uh, famous photograph was uh, taken of President Truman at St. Louis Union Station after the elections, and uh, Mr. Truman had a great time with that newspaper in St. Louis that day. The Magellan has been retired as a presidential mover for half a century, done in by the rise of the automobile. Now on exhibit at the Gold Coast Railroad Museum in Miami, it represents the last of the more leisurely presidential movers. Another leisurely presidential mover is really more of a presidential retreat. The presidential yachts, which began with a steamer used by Rutherford B. Hayes in 1880, aren't so much modes of transportation as modes of recreation. The yachts have kind of a party-like ambiance to them. You know, it's a place where you go for meetings or kind of a, a leisurely cruise. But I don't think they fall into the category of practical, essential travel. Presidents have officially entertained on them, as Truman did on the Williamsburg. And presidents have escaped from their burdens on them, as Kennedy did on the Honey Fitz. The LBJ loved to play poker on this yacht. Uh, he'd bring his congressman on one of the yachts and tell him, gentlemen, we're not leaving until you agree with me. But there was always the nagging debate that they were an expensive luxury of an imperial presidency. Carter ended the debate in the late 1970s when he ordered the USS Sequoia auctioned off. If yachts best facilitated the president's escape from the people, then automobiles did just the opposite. No mode of transportation better allows the president to impart a message to his people than the car. It's personal, it's intimate, and it's also a security nightmare. The battle between the president's need to be seen and to be safe is waged around the automobile. George W. Bush rode to his January 2001 inaugural in an elegant black Cadillac DeVille stretch limousine. Or at least, that's what it looked like. This thing is its own beast. Cadillac is the builder of the current limousines for the president. It has to make the car look like a Cadillac, but of course it's not. I think down to the ornament on the hood is oversized. Details are classified, but you can bet the car is armored, contains bulletproof glass, and has run-flat tires. Surely it hides defenses within its chassis, uses an air filtration system, and electromagnetic pulse defenses. It likely has night vision technology that projects infrared images. And that's just the car. There's also a driver, a very good driver, trained to flee any danger. The fleet of cars at the Bush administration's disposal is part of a century-old tradition of presidential transport that began with William McKinley, who became the first president to travel in an automobile, a Stanley steamer, in 1899. But it was William Howard Taft who established the car as a presidential mover. 
He convinces Congress to authorize within the normal $25,000 travel appropriation, which authorizes expense upon horses and carriages that Roosevelt had, he gets Congress to change that to include and automobiles. Now, Congress went crazy. Well, the winning argument, uh, what was said to be the winning argument, was that it would be cruelty to animals to have Taft be uh, carried around by a horse. But really, the winning argument was that the president wanted these automobiles, and the president was going to get them. Due in part to Taft's endorsement, the auto industry doubled production during his first year in office. He literally put the presidential seal on the auto, displaying it on his favorite car, a 1909 White Company Model M seven-passenger, 40-horsepower steamer. One of the most technologically advanced automobiles of the day. The White Company bragged that the car that the president has is the same as any car he could get from us. So the president's taking a car right off the shelf, basically. Under Taft, the White House stables were converted into a garage. In 1921, Warren G. Harding became the first president to motor to his inauguration. But it was FDR, who in the 1930s received the first armored vehicle, a limousine. Among the fleet of limousines specially built for chief executives since 1942, four stand out. The first is FDR's Lincoln K. Initially, it had no armor or bulletproof glass. It was after Pearl Harbor that the car was armor-plated. Uh, although it never had a permanent roof. And Franklin Roosevelt uh, enjoyed very much uh, riding with the top down. That's apparently where the nickname the Sunshine Special came from. This car became an emblem of his administration. It was the way people saw him. He actually praised his chauffeur. He said, Monty can drive through a crowd of 30,000s and not step on one toe. And, and so his chauffeur was an expert at driving through people crowding around the car trying to reach the president. Eisenhower introduced the bubble top, a clear plastic shell that fit over his convertible parade car so the people who braved bad weather to see him wouldn't be disappointed. It was actually a car that was built for Harry Truman. It was a 1949 Lincoln, another open car. That car was used by Truman. It was used by Eisenhower. It was actually used into the Kennedy administration. That car was completely unarmor plated, no bulletproof glass, no armor, no nothing. At that time in American history, the president's political necessities trumped his security requirements. Well trained drivers still took the wheel and Secret Service men ran alongside. But the president straddled the breach of his two competing needs. Now, if we left it up to the Secret Service to decide what the president's car looks like, it won't have any windows. Windows are a safety concession to politics. The Secret Service, of course, wants to keep the president hermetically sealed. And there's a constant tension there. The most famous presidential limousine of all graphically illustrated this point. The car, a four-ton Lincoln Continental Stretch X100, cost the government nearly $195,000 to retrofit for President Kennedy. It was one of 131 vehicles in his fleet. Some of its safety features were two rear-facing jump seats, outside handles for Secret Service agents, retractable running boards, a presidential seat that could be raised and lowered, and a tight turning radius. And as we see in 1963, if you take the roof off, it all comes to nothing. John F. Kennedy was assassinated as he sat in his unarmored Stretch X-100 caught between politics and safety. Rarely has a single event had such far-reaching impact. The Secret Service was in a quandary. They, they now demanded that the president have an armored car. And they had a choice. They could either build a brand new car or they could modify the existing car. The reason the Secret Service rebuilt the Stretch X-100 rather than order and customize a new one was cost. After the Warren Commission examined and documented it, the car was released to the Secret Service. It still cost a million dollars to renovate, including a $125,000, 1,500-pound windshield of bulletproof glass. They stripped the car down mechanically. They welded on a permanent 
armor plated roof, they armor plated the body, they armor plated the doors uh, all around the passenger compartment underneath the car. They had a, an early version of run flat tires. It has communications systems and radios and such inside so you can communicate with the Secret Service and the helicopters up above. So it was a thoroughgoing rebuild of the car. It continued to serve Presidents Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter. President Nixon even cut a hole in the roof so he could stand up and wave to crowds, thoroughly compromising all of the reinforcements added after the Kennedy assassination. The last of the four famous historical presidential limousines was built for Gerald Ford in 1972. Weighing in at 13,000 pounds, it could resist a grenade thrown beneath it. It's come to be called the Reagan car because it was the car that Ronald Reagan was getting into when he was shot. And it shows the limits of the protection afforded by a car. This car is thoroughly armor plated. Yet Reagan wasn't inside the car. Yet. The bullet bounced off the limousine. So good as the armor, just bounced right off and landed in the president's chest, nearly killing him. The Reagan car joins the Sunshine Special, the Bubble Top, and the Kennedy Limo on display at the Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. But the president isn't limited to autos for short trips. There's also Marine One, the most technologically sophisticated helicopter in the world. The current Marine One helicopter is the most agile of all the presidential movers, able to lift off from an airport tarmac and place the president back home on the lawn of the White House. President Eisenhower ushered in presidential helicopter travel on July 12, 1957, in an attempt to simplify short trips to places like Camp David without involving the fleet of presidential limousines. The first presidential helicopter was a Bell H-13. That's the military version of the uh, bubble-topped uh, helicopter you see on the intro to MASH. There was very little space on the inside and the Secret Service felt that it really wasn't safe for the president. Eisenhower's two-man H-13 was quickly replaced by a more spacious Sikorsky H-34C, which could accommodate half a dozen passengers. Perfect for traveling the 70 miles to Camp David, it didn't require motorcades or stop traffic, and it was twice as fast as a limousine. Eisenhower saw the practicality of helicopters for short shuttle flights, and he liked the way you could get in and out of a place. And you think of the security measures, if you, if you go by helicopter, uh, that it arguably is more secure than moving in limousine across the landscape. But some presidential guests were leery. Soviet Premier Khrushchev refused Eisenhower's invitation for a ride during his United States visit in 1959. He really thought that this might be an effort to get him up in a helicopter and just crash the helicopter and, and get one major problem for the United States out of the way. But then to his surprise, President Eisenhower indicated he was going to go too. And so then uh, Khrushchev immediately backed, oh, well, fine, I I'm ready to go. Under Kennedy, the presidential choppers were the Sikorsky VH-34As, also known as H-3s. The H-3 airframes were in service until 1975. It's probably one of the best-known helicopters today. It was also one that's been around the longest. The 3A had an amphibious hull, so it had a capability of landing and taking off from uh, the water for short periods of time. The rotor path on the 72-foot-long craft had a 62-foot diameter. It sported two 1,400-horsepower engines. The cockpit had a large window with two large reclining chairs and the navigational system and radios were the best available at the time. In the uh, presidential cabin, they had a, a, the bench area where about five people in those days could sit. And then behind the, uh, the president's in the next compartment, we had a, a small latrine. They also had a small galley aboard the, uh, the plane. Marine One usually cruised at 135 miles per hour, roughly 1,000 feet in the air for flights that lasted between 30 minutes and an hour. Kennedy even enjoyed showing his family how the choppers worked. As the co-pilot was checking over around the helicopter, he, he looked up and he saw the tail rotors winging and flapping back and forth. 
And he says, whoa, oh, something's wrong with that. So he ran and looked in the cockpit, and there was John John, and John John was on the stick, and the president says, yeah, push it forward, then pull it back. <laughs> so then the pilot says, Mr. President, he says, anything I can help you with? He says, no, no, we're getting along fine. Although the Marines are closely associated with the president's helicopter travel, initially the task was shared with the Army. In fact, Nixon's memorable departure from the White House in 1974 actually took place aboard the Army One helicopter. Like Air Force One, any Army or Marine vehicle transporting the president becomes Army One or Marine One. The Marine HMX-1 squadron took over sole responsibility in 1975. They bought uh, additional new H3s. Those are still in service today. The differences are some technology improvements with the rotor head and so on, and vibration dampening, and power plants have improved. General Electric makes those power plants. The current Marine 1H3 can travel 140 miles per hour at 14,400 feet for up to 600 miles, depending on its payload. Energy absorbent landing gear and crash resistant fuel tanks make it safer. It employs light armor, special protection from electronics damaging electromagnetic pulses, and probably weighs about 10 tons. But most information about the craft is top secret. But we do know that the four person crew can serve 15 passengers. Sound dampeners, air conditioning, a galley, and a restroom contribute to its comfort. It has two 1,500 horsepower General Electric turboshaft engines, but it can stay in the air with only one functioning. It's the smoothest, I believe, I'm prejudiced, the smoothest uh, helicopter ride you could have, certainly the most comfortable and most quiet. The president also has a smaller, modified Sikorsky Blackhawk, which can resist an attack from 23 millimeter shells while traveling at speeds approaching 180 miles per hour. Four crew members and eight passengers can travel up to 445 miles, carrying over 20,000 pounds. Two General Electric 1,630 horsepower engines keep it aloft. Although Marine One offers the convenience of quick, short flights that avoid traffic and the logistical challenges of presidential ground transport, its greatest asset is its ability to remove the president from danger faster than any other presidential mover. Marine One went very quickly, uh, get to the president, and move him away from that uh, concern or threat, or move him to a medical facility if that, uh, God forbid, if that, that happened. Marine One, like all presidential movers, has its utilitarian purpose. Each presidential mover gets the president from here to there. But they are more than just vehicles. They help presidents make history. And occasionally, they make history themselves.